Today, CFC, I'm super excited to be able to finish um, Galatians with you. Um, we kind of work our way through Scripture. We're in Galatians chapter 6, verse 11 today. Just by way of reminder, when you say, what is the book of Galatians about? It's about freedom. It's for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm and don't submit again to a yoke of slavery. The freedom that's being talked about here is to fully rely on God. The freedom of relying on God. I'm not in a religion. I'm in a love relationship with God. I'm not following some law-based system. I'm pressing into a personal relationship with God, and then he, he meets me there, and he informs me and helps me on how to do things, all right? So verse 11 today, see with what large letters I'm writing to you with my own hand. A lot of people back then would have a scribe, and they would dictate, and the scribe would write, right? And then at the end of the letter, they would sign with their own hand. And what was Paul's favorite signature? May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And he would sign that with his own hand. But in this case, he's writing the whole final paragraph in huge letters because of his eye problem. He had some sort of an eye ailment. So if you could imagine reading the original manuscript of Galatians, you would read a nice handwriting, and this professional scribe, and then he's writing with these huge letters. It's almost like he's saying, don't miss this. Don't miss this. This is me writing right now. This is like, and I want to share with you, this is what my core conviction is. This is what my rule of life is as he comes towards the end of the book of Galatians. So that's where we're going to be today. The idea today is, is the core conviction that Paul says, I want to keep rejoicing in the cross of Jesus. Um, that's where I want to be. We were talking this morning uh, about um, Thanksgiving coming up. It's like, Wait, and by the way, guys, if you hadn't remembered, Thanksgiving's on Thursday. So, and some of us are like, what? I have to call my parents. What are we doing? So, but someone mentioned this morning, it's not really Thanksgiving, it's thanks living. And it's this idea that I want to be thankful um, for the cross of Jesus Christ. I just want to keep rejoicing. Imagine doing that around the table today. Uh, you know, the, every, all the food is hot uh, on Thursday. I mean, the food is hot. We're ready to dig in. And then someone says, all right, let's go around the table. What are we thankful for? And people are like, Man, the food is getting cold. But we got to, you know, so you, you work your way around. What if, you, what if you said, I'm just so thankful for the cross of Jesus? I'm so thankful for the cross of Jesus. And it's like every day, it's this thanks living. I want to boast in the cross of Jesus. That's what I want to boast about. And so that was kind of um, Paul's main target. His focus is to boast in that. What's really cool in our passage today is you have a contrast between human boasting and then cross-centered boasting and what that looks like. So human boasting, in verse 12, he calls out the religious crowd. It's those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who force you to be circumcised and only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. Even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the whole law, but they desire to have you circumcised so they can boast in your flesh. And... Um, if you were to take the core conviction of the Judaizers, the religious people, it would be the need for approval, okay? The need for approval. We, we have to um, find significance and value in life based on how many likes we get. That's, I, I need this approval. I need to know that other people approve of me, and that's what they're feeding on. So in verse 12, one of the characteristics is the need to impress um, you want to make a good showing, right? That's human boasting. I have the need um, to impress. And when I feel good about myself, then I'm motivated to do more. And that's what I feed off of. <clears throat> so I was in a restaurant with Jen recently. And, and we had these wooden, there were these wooden chairs. Kind of uncomfortable. Like I was sitting with this 90 degree angle and subconsciously, I just pushed back a little bit, and poof, the whole chair broke. And I'm holding on, like kind of sliding down, and Jen just starts bursting out laughing. Well, she wouldn't stop laughing. It went on for five minutes, ten minutes. She's just laughing and laughing and laughing. And I'm like, Jen, you have to stop laughing. Everybody's watching us like you're getting attention. And she just kept laughing. And, then, and, and so I, I kept trying to tell myself, embarrassment is a wasted emotion. Embarrassment is a wasted emotion. And I'm so embarrassed, you know. Uh, this summer, we, we were going to get on a ferry to go to Sicily, 
Um, and um, you had to, like, there was a whole group of Italians chattering. And I'm trying to get past to get to where you get on the ferry. And there was such loud music that I couldn't say, scusi, scusi, right? So I just ended up tapping this woman on the shoulder, and she was dressed to the hilt with these beautiful, like, Italian modern sunglasses and her hairstyle and everything. And she sort of looked over at me like, you cockroach, don't touch me. <laughs> I was so embarrassed. <laughs> oh. So then we get, on, we get on the ferry, and it's like there's 400 seats. She's sitting in the front, and she gets seasick, right? So this is a half an hour later, and she's going, ah, 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 ah. and she goes, she runs to the back, right? And for 45 minutes, you can hear her groaning, oh, oh, and I'm like, she must be embarrassed now. Like, there's point of people. So I'm embarrassed, and now you're embarrassed. It kind of felt good, but I just hate. Being embarrassed, I have to, like, in my mind, say embarrassment is a wasted emotion. It's fine. It's fine. People get seasick, you know. The, the idea behind human boasting is, is we get into situations, and you guys will sort of compare yourselves. If you're selling real estate, if you're a teacher, if you're uh, in, in the medical field, right? You're, if you're in business, it's always like checking each other out, and you have to sort of uh, check each other out and, 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 and try to impress or put your best foot forward. A second thing that is interesting in this human boasting is that we get forceful with others. So the Judaizers um, were forcing them to be circumcised. It wasn't even about um, the, the spiritual development of these people. It was how many people, how many numbers, how many converts, how many people can you, and then you feel good, you can go back to Jerusalem and say, like, we got a bunch of these Gentiles to be circumcised. And they're like, yeah, that's great. And they're all excited, like they're celebrating all of these wins. And, but it's, it's not really helpful to the people. It's, force, it's forceful, right? So when I went to, a, um, Jason and I were at a pastor's conference for a couple of days this week. And it's interesting, even within pastor's conferences, you can come in there and um, you can be checking each other out, right? It's like, have you ever seen dogs in a park? They sniff each other's butts, right? It's like, <laughs> hey, let's check it. And then how big is your church? And you're kind of, you're kind of fit, like, where do we fit in? Who's the one who's really the influential one? And, and how can we like, and so it's interesting that you can get into this mode where, where you're, it, there's human boasting, there's the idea of impressing, and then even being forceful um, to move in a direction um, to be able to, to get some, some traction. And we do that. You do that in business. You do that um, in your profession sometimes. And it's just um, part of human boasting. And then um, the end of verse 12, that they may not be persecuted for the cross, that's the idea of um, being liked. So if I could be part of two groups, um, which one do I want to be a part of? The one that's being persecuted and they're systematically executing these people or can I be a part of the other group? And so the Judaizers um, were wanting to be a part of the other group to be liked by, hey, this is a system, it's working, like we can impress other people, we can feed our human ego. And then what happens is um, the truth of the gospel isn't being propagated because they just want to be liked. They want to be liked. The cross was actually a stumbling block, and it still is today, the offense of the cross. And um, if you're truly following Jesus, you're not going to be liked all the time. You're just not. I was at the airport um, and had a couple minutes to burn and kind of browsing around the shop in the airport. And this woman says, there's a young woman and an older woman, and the older woman says to me, um, do you have any questions for me? And so I was like, actually, I do have a question. What is the purpose of life? <laughs> so stupid. <laughs> so the young one chimes in, it's to have fun. And the older one is like, well, do to others what you want done to you, you know? And so, so we talked a little bit about the purpose of life. And somehow there's that tension point there. Do I, am I going to do this now? Am I going to go, you need Jesus. Like, you need to... <laughs> And I, fe I, feel, I feel that all the time. Like, I don't want to unnecessarily offend or step on people's toes. But there's like, they, they need Jesus. They need Jesus. And so I feel the tension of, I want to be liked. And, and when I get on the, into the human boasting mode, then I'm not, then I, then I'm not 
um, carrying the mindset that at, there's a time to just tell people the way it is, whether they like it or not. You need Jesus. You, your, your destiny, you're in trouble. And it's interesting that in human boasting, you're driven to be liked. And then the third one was interesting, uh, the fourth one, that they're fake. So they, um, they're circumcised, but they don't hold to the whole law. Remember when I had the rope up here and I said, like, how many, with the knife, like, which law do you want? You start with one, you cut it off, you're, you're severed from Christ. You're no longer relying on Jesus. Now we're back to being law-based. And Paul uncovers them and says, they, they don't obey all the laws. No one can fully obey all the laws. What are you relying on? And so remember, just re remember back in the book of Galatians, the comparison that it's like a cancer. It's like the DNA has been altered. And in religious communities and a lot of church communities, there's all this stuff going on about like impressing people and putting on a show. And then he brings up the leaven in chapter four. Remember that, how it permeates and puffs up. And that permeates the Christian community. So we're at this pastor's conference and um, this pastor gets up, like, after the breakout sessions, everyone's together, and he gets up, and he starts to share his testimony of, you know, how he was abandoned by his parents when he was 15. And then he, he started a church in Florida, and it blew up. There were, like, 7,000 people attending his church. He's only 29 years old. And then his wife finds out on the Internet that he has a porn addiction, right? So that went into a whole story of his recovery, he started a ministry called Tin Man, and he, he was talking about how there are, um, w there are pastors and there are other people in business or whatever, you're working your way up the ladder, okay? You're, you're going to do whatever it takes to impress people. You're going to do whatever it takes to force people into the sale. You're going to do whatever it takes to be liked. You're, you're fake, and you're a Tin Man. And then he started talking about some of these people who will come for recovery and how they develop these covenant kingdom relationships of like a band of brothers, right? A, a, a group of people that you can sit and have honest discussions with and how healing that is, right? Because it's not fake anymore. And some people will say the premise of church is people will come in upstairs, but it's downstairs in AA uh, where the guy says, I'm Bruce, <laughs> I'm an addict, you know. And, and where I've said to you guys, like, we are all addicts in our own way. We're all addicted to ourselves in some way. And it's so powerful and permission-giving. You should have seen the room afterwards, after this pastor shared, of how quickly we were able to connect with each other and have honest conversations with strangers. Like, yeah. And to be able to say, um, I don't, I don't want to be fake. Like, I want, to, I want to address things with where they are. And the problem is that human boasting gets in the way, Right? Let's flip the switch now because the, the core um, conviction that Paul has is he's like, I, I'm going to boast about my weaknesses all the more because of the cross. And I want to just show you a little bit of the cross-centered boasting and the dynamic of that. So far be it for me to boast except in the cross. So I'm not going to boast about anything anymore except in the cross of Jesus by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. He's sort of been able to separate himself a little more, a degree of separation from all of this worldly, shame-based culture. Circumcision or uncircumcision doesn't count anything. It's the new creation that counts. As for all who walk by this rule, may shalom, uh, wholeness reign in your life, and may mercy be upon you and upon the Israel of God. So I just want to break this down for a couple of minutes for you. Far be it from me to boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, the word boast means to rejoice or to glory. Far be it for me to rejoice or to glory, except in the cross. And um, Paul, Paul used to be the guy, when his name was Saul, who would, who would quickly drop you know, the, the little nuances. Oh, oh yeah, I was... I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. <clears throat> yeah, I'm, I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. I actually was uh, trained under, and then you know, the name dropping. I had, we had some name dropping at the pastor's conference. It's pretty funny, actually. 
Yeah, I know the guy who knew the guy who wrote this book, whatever. And um, I was a Pharisee, you know, a persecutor of the false way. And thinking that, like, he's, like, really serving God when he's actually killing Christians. It's just, like, you're, you're way off, dude. Like, you think that you're all religious and following God, and you're doing so much damage to the body of Christ. And then he flips, Paul says in Philippians 3, I count it all as, I won't use the expletive, but dung, that's a good word. I count it as dung, like garbage compared to the value of actually knowing Jesus, to know him. And um, he says, I'm, I'm actually boasting in the cross. <clears throat> Do any of you have a cross here today, a piece of jewelry? All right, you got... So anyone else? Like some, sometimes they're beautiful. You have like this shiny cross. And um, for us today, we see that and it's, it's beautiful jewelry. What, what, what this wording means here, the cross, is like the, it, it is, it is a, a term back then that should not have even been mentioned. They didn't want to mention it in culture because it's so excruciating, painful. It's, it's, it's associated with shame and rejection, like the ultimate. It's like saying... The only thing that I glory in is the gas chamber. The only thing that is important to me is lethal injection. That's like what these people are reading and, and, and taking in right now. And what Paul is saying, the only thing that I'm glorying in is like I had to face my shame and rejection head on and I had to literally die with Jesus. I had to, I had to go to the gas chamber in order to be raised to walk a new life, and I, I don't even live anymore. I'm crucified with Christ. I no longer live. It's now Jesus Christ who lives in me. And it's this beautiful idea that um, the love of Jesus and what he has done for me now compels me. I have a new motivation to want to um, serve Jesus and engage with other people because of what Jesus has done with me. I have a new focus. It's the engine that drives me. So instead of the engine that drives you being, I'm motivated because I feel so good about myself, right? That's our default. But now Paul is saying, I'm motivated because I feel so good about the love of Jesus and what he has done for me. You notice that? It's just beautiful. It's so freeing. That's what compels me. So the new motivation. And then I found in here, he brings um, us to this little wording, the new creation, the new creation. Um, actually, let me go back. You're right. I'm missing 2 Corinthians. Here's a great one on new, new motivation. He says, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. It's a beautiful illustration of sort of flipping that and saying, I... I have this new motivation in Christ, and I, and, I, and I love to kind of walk in that and boast only in the cross. Um, the new creation. Let's look at that next one. I have a new motivation, and then I have a new creation. I'm a new creation. Um, so neither circumcision or uncircumcision counts anything. It's the idea of being a new creation in Jesus. That idea of new creation um, is this beautiful concept that not only did I receive my salvation through what Jesus did on the cross, but also the process of my sanctification, the Holy Spirit. Remember walking by the Spirit? The more I learn to walk by the Spirit, the more um, transformation is happening in my life. It's a, it's a total change to like the religious experience of behavioral modification. I'm actually trying to press into the relationship with Jesus, and then the transformation just begins to happen because of my proximity to Jesus. And it's, it's beautiful to be able to see the transformation that can happen because of that. It's like, it's like I'm, I'm learning to have a new operating system and to, um, to begin to focus more on um, Jesus and on walking with him, all right? So the new creation that he has created, this moment-by-moment moment walking with him. And then in verse 16, he brings up um, the idea of the Israel of God. So... As for all who walk by this rule, may peace or wholeness rest on you. May um, mercy be upon you and upon the Israel of God. 
That was strange to me when I read that. Normally it says what? The God of Israel. And the Jews prided themselves in being the sons of Abraham. And everyone else is dirty, right? They're unclean. But Paul flips it and he says, the Israel of God. And he's referring back again to that little dialogue in in chapter 4. Did you realize that Abraham had two sons? Isaac and Ishmael. And Ishmael are Jews, Palestinians, Muslims, Buddhists, whatever other religious group you want to put in there. Anyone who is walking in a law-based system, that's Ishmael. The sons of Isaac are those who walk according to the faith of Abraham. We've put our faith in God. And they will be as um, the multitude of the stars. You won't even be able to, to contain them. God is speaking prophetically of Gentiles in all generations around the world who put their faith in Jesus Christ and are actually born again, this new, this new, this new nation that we are a part of, the Israel of God. That's the nation, and that's something that is completely cross-centered. I have a new motivation, I have a new creation, and I'm part of a new nation of the children of God. If you're here today and you're born again, the Bible says in 1 Peter 2 that you are actually a holy nation and a royal priesthood. In other words, you represent God to other people. And so the context of that is, and now, now here we're really pressing down into it, is that what, what we see here even today in church is that you're the pastor in your community. You are the holy priesthood if you know Jesus, okay? And the work of building the church is out there. And I'm, I'm sort of an equipper. We meet once a week. We gather. We inspire. We stay on mission together. And then we go out to be the church, okay? And so... We go out and we tell our stories to other people, and we boast in only one thing, in the cross of Jesus. And so we're part of a whole new nation. That is who we are, and it, it infiltrates all different political groups, all different, all different socioeconomic groups, all different races. I actually identify as being part of this new nation, the Israel of God. Does that make sense? That's who you are in Christ Jesus. That's where we identify. I want to just close with this idea of walking by this rule. That's kind of, he's saying, um, I want to um, walk by this rule. Verses 17 and 18 is that I'm going to live by grace. I'm going to keep rejoicing in the cross. I'm going to live by, by grace. From now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear the marks of Jesus. In other words, I'm tired of you legalists. I've, I've been beaten beyond measure. I've had five times 39 lashes. I've been beaten three times with rods. I've been stoned once, and it wasn't drugs. I was shipwrecked three times, adrift for 24 hours, frequent travel, dangers, rivers, robbers, his own people, Gentiles. In cities, I'm in danger. In the wilderness, I'm in danger. False brothers, sleepless nights, hunger, thirst, cold, exposure, the daily pressure of the churches. I'm tired of you legalists. Coming in here and bringing leaven and making church toxic. There's so much freedom in just relying fully on Jesus. And so this is where he ends now. This is big letters in his signature. May the grace of Jesus be with your spirit, brothers. Amen. May the grace of Jesus be with your spirit. A couple days ago, I was biking up the, uh, the Susquehanna River on the bike trail and um, I saw this young guy sort of looking like he had lost something around the parking lot. So I, I said, um, are, you, are you looking for something? And he's like, yeah, I, I lost 20 bucks. I don't know. So I've, I'm like, I happen to have a 20 in my car, so I'm like, here, just take this. So he starts tearing up, right? I said, can, can I pray for you? And, and, and so then he's tearing up a little more, and he's like, my, my grandmother used to take me to church. I need to get back to a church. And um, I said, hey, hi, I'm a pastor. You should come to my church. So. <laughs> <laughs> so this is what he said. I'm afraid to go to church because of what people will think of me. I don't like that. 
church is a hospital, guys. And, and real church is like real people with real conversations <laughs> with where we are. And that's Galatians, right? Enough for the self-righteousness. All right, let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we, we boast today only in the cross of Jesus. Only in the cross of Jesus. And I pray that you would forgive us for the many times when we put so much energy into impressing others and trying to cover our own shame. And we ask that you would continue to grow um, healing communities among us, honest conversation, a place where we can talk about our wounds and rejoice in the cross together. And Lord, I pray if someone is in the room who doesn't know you, that they would take that step. Just, if that's you, just while we're praying together, if you're here today and you have not put your faith in Jesus Christ, then say, Jesus, thank you for loving me. Forgive me for doing my own thing. Come into my life and save me. Forgive me for all my sin and all the junk. Come into my life and save me, Jesus. And if that's you, the Bible says that the angels in heaven rejoice when one person comes to Jesus. Your name is written in the book of life. You're forgiven. You're born again. You're adopted into the family of God. You've been redeemed and bought with a price. And Lord, I want to thank you for that one And then if there's some of you in the room today, I want to give you a moment to process. Maybe you've accepted Christ. But this week, um, where have you felt driven to not be you? Where have you felt driven this week to not be you? And can you just talk to Jesus for a minute about that? Where have you felt driven to not be you? Just talk to Jesus for a minute about that.